Kieran Duran could be the fastest man in the world as his speed has been put on full display for the Boston Red Sox so far this season. You are Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbut, former ESPN social media associate and also currently the host of the Boston Balling Podcast. And I am here to bring you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox Monday through Friday, straight to your favorite podcast feed. And you want to know what the best part about it is? It's free. So if it's free, why not tune in? It is your team every day. Locked On is your team every day. And Locked On Red Sox is the only Red Sox podcast that is here for you every day. And welcome to another episode of the show. And thank you to all my everydayers who constantly tune into the show every day. I truly would not be where I am today without people like you showing your support. So I really appreciate that. I see you. I love reading your comments. I love interacting with you. It's so much fun. So I hope you continue to listen. And one guy who's giving people a reason to want to listen so far this season is Jaron Duran. I mean, this kid literally could be the fastest man in the world. He came into this season with a lot of hype surrounding him after the season he had last year. We already knew he was fast and athletic, but his bat really caught up to speed with that last year no pun intended he had a very good offensive season he was the spark the red sox needed in their lineup for a good chunk of the season when a lot of other people were struggling he was the one that would keep the offense alive and awake and then unfortunately missed part of the last half of the season with an injury so his season got cut short which was unfortunate he was going to make a play in the outfield and hopped over the fence and hurt himself So it was definitely not an ideal situation for him. So we didn't get to see the rest of the season for him and how it would have played out. But heading into 2024, I was very excited to see him carry over that offensive productivity from last year. Because if he can carry over that same offensive productivity and be similar at the plate to what he was last year, that's going to be massive for a Red Sox team that has some players in the lineup who are unproven and they need to see more of Tristan Casas falls into that category. Tyler O'Neill falls into that category just because he has only played a handful of games so far in a Red Sox uniform. And so far we've seen a lot of good things from him, but definitely still needs to continue to get his feet wet in Boston and acclimate himself to being here a little bit. But he's definitely been off to a good start. So it's definitely a lineup that has a few question marks. Emmanuel Valdez still kind of finding his way, learning what his place is on this team. So Jaron Duran stepping up for the rest of the season would be huge. In 21 at-bats of 2024, he recorded five hits and batted at 238, scored three runs and recorded one RBI, and broke a Red Sox record for stolen bases by stealing five bases in five games. So that's pretty cool. I mean, he is so fast. And every time he gets on base now, you have to expect that he's going to try to steal because he's too fast not to, and there's no reason for him not to. In certain scenarios, he might not. I mean, depending on the matchup and if it's a pitcher who very much pays a ton of attention to the base runner, but he's too fast to not try to send almost every time. I mean, he's definitely at the point where he'd be trusted to steal a base whenever he wants to. He almost stole home plate the other night in a game and then decided against it, but he was halfway there, so I thought he was really going to do it. So it was interesting to me because... 
he has that speed that will carry the Red Sox through. If they are really in a slump or there's a game where the offense can't get going and Duran gets himself on base, getting himself into scoring position could be a huge difference maker for Boston because then you're looking at somebody just needing to slide one through or you're hoping for an error that gets him over to third base and then hope that he can eventually come home on a sack fly or something along those lines if the Reds of of the lineup really can't hit. So that's the beauty of playing small ball, and that's how some teams as a whole are effective, is you're finding ways to advance the runners, and it's not necessarily always via power or the home run. So what I'm excited to see from Duran moving forward is getting that batting average up a little bit more, making contact, being aggressive, because he's definitely on his way to being super successful again, in Monday night's game against the A's, a 9 to nothing blowout win, he was on an absolute roll. He singled in each of the first three innings and also stole a base in each of those innings. So he was just having himself an absolute blast. And he enjoyed it for sure. I mean, breaking a record mid-game and getting three hits in your first three at-bats is definitely something for him to be proud of. Now, granted... Playing Oakland, it's a little bit different because they are just not a good team at all, and they were facing just some not very competitive pitching, and the A's made a ton of errors that helped the Red Sox, but the errors themselves aren't as much the story, more so how well the Red Sox did to capitalize on those errors because they had a lot of missed opportunities last year in terms of being able to capitalize on mistakes that the other team makes, and For the Red Sox now, you're seeing the aggressiveness and them being able to adapt when another team makes an error and making them pay for that mistake. And that's something I really liked that they as a team did on Monday night. But Duran is an absolute menace, seems ready to go this year and wants to continue to improve. And you know you can always rely on his speed on those base paths, which is very good because... I will give the Red Sox lineup credit. They are good at hitting their singles, stringing together hits. And I talked a lot about on yesterday's show flow of the lineup and chemistry. And for some reason, it might be a mental thing. If somebody in the lineup is clicking, it seems like everybody else starts to flow and they're either stringing together a bunch of hits or no hits. So if they're stringing together a bunch of hits and you have Jaron Duran on base, you know you can send him more often than not. Now, granted, there might be some situations like if a pitcher is more aware of what's going on or if there's two outs and they don't want to take the risk, then I understand. But if there's zero or one out and he gets on base, there's literally zero reason in the world not to send him. So, My bet is that you'll see a lot more stolen bases from Duran this year as it is his strength. He'll continue to play in the outfield and he can make some good plays in the outfield too because of his legs and ability to move quickly around the field. So he can take up a lot of field when running after a ball. So I like his defensive ability in the outfield as well. So what I'm looking for from him is to continue to get that batting average up, make himself look confident out there, swing at what he knows he can swing at, because if it's a single, the chances of him turning it into a double are incredibly high. He does that pretty regularly as well. Um, So lots to be excited about with Jaron Duran, but he is one of those players who can be a very crucial piece For the Red Sox moving forward, I hope to see a lot more aggressiveness from him that he doesn't shy away from stealing bases. He's not afraid to really get after it and be that guy out there who's setting the tone for the rest of the lineup, especially because he's hitting in the leadoff spot the majority of the time. He can set that tone, get himself on base, and then try to steal to make it easier for Devers or whoever bats second to be able to drive him in on the next at bat. So I'm a fan of Duran hitting in the leadoff spot. I hope he continues to grow and continues to be a guy who we see a lot of energy from all season long and somebody who's just really attacking baseballs and advancing himself from base to base and keeping his head on a swivel because that's going to be really beneficial for this Red Sox team moving forward. 
We've also officially seen every starter pitch one time through for Boston, and it was a very pleasant surprise how they each performed. So coming up, I'm going to be talking about the fifth and final starter for the Red Sox in his first appearance of the season. If you're looking for a fun way to play daily fantasy sports, Prize Picks has you covered. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs, take your pick of more or less and add them to your prize picks entry today. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason, which, by the way, is coming up very quickly. The playoffs begin April 20th with the play-in round April 16th, 17th, and 19th. So definitely get prepared to win a lot of money there. Download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's a first deposit match up to $100 if you use code LOCKEDONMLB. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It really is that easy. Prize picks will make your experience well worth it. So definitely check that out today. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you-can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. You definitely won't want to miss out on this. We will keep you in the loop on all things going on in sports and all the biggest storylines. So subscribe to Lockdown Sports today as well. Tanner Houck finally made his first appearance of the season for the Red Sox as a starting pitcher on Monday night in the Red Sox 9-0 blowout win against the A's. And he absolutely crushed it. Now, granted, keep in mind, it is Oakland, so let's not read too, too much into it. But Red Sox starters overall have looked very good so far. And Houck was somebody I was really curious to see pitch because of the fact that he has struggled in the past of pitching deep into games. Once he starts to see a lineup the third time through, that's when he would start to struggle. And it's because he primarily focused on utilizing two pitches as opposed to three or four pitches that he could alternate between. And during Monday's game, he pitched six strong innings with shutout baseball and struck out 10 batters and gave up zero walks. So it was a very strong start. He looked dominant. He looked very confident out there. He had total command and it was very hard for the opposing hitters to catch a feel for him all game. And when he came back out for the sixth, I said, this will be really interesting to see because this is around the time of the game that he really struggles. So if he's able to get through six very well, then that's a promising sign for him moving forward. He only gave up three hits on the night too. So he looked fantastic and it added to the repertoire of great pitching in those first five games through Tanner Houck's start. Every pitcher got through at least five innings. So for every starter to go at least five innings in their first start of the season, that's huge for the Red Sox because longevity and getting starters to eat innings was a big problem last year. And it's something that Andrew Bailey and Alex Cora set as a goal for the starters going into this year is they wanted 
each starter to focus on going five innings because if they each can go five innings, then that gives the bullpen significantly more rest than they had last year. And if you can go six like Tanner Houck did, then that's an absolute bonus. So I thought it was really impressive that he didn't walk a single hitter and he was just so locked in and in control the entire time. And with his pitch arsenal, he definitely mixed up his pitches a lot. His slider still remains nasty. It's so fun watching him throw that pitch. It's one of those things where why not continue to utilize that pitch heavily if it's a really good pitch for you. That slider was his go-to. He was able to strike out a lot of guys using that pitch. He also mixed in a splitter, which I thought was very good that he used a decent amount of the time as well. So it was interesting to see his plate approach. He also had a sinker that was in there that was effective too. So he's starting to grow in terms of his pitch arsenal and what he's using where because he relied very heavily on two solid pitches before and it caused opposing hitters to figure him out a lot quicker during games and get a stronger read on him as a pitcher and what he was going to throw. So if he can continue to mix different pitches in there consistently, that'll be really beneficial for him in the long run. Now, another thing to note about Tanner Houck and the Red Sox starters in general is that ability to just straight up look and appear confident. Tanner Houck is somebody who has always had a fighting face of, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to shove. But when the results aren't there, he gets visibly frustrated about it and then has to wait until his next start to make up for it. And he doesn't like that time in between. So he, in particular, is somebody who I feel really needed to have a good start in his first outing so that he could grow that confidence of saying, okay, I'm ready to go. And more importantly, so that he can build that trust of his new pitching coach, Andrew Bailey. Because when somebody new comes into the fold, you don't know how they're going to be, what their coaching style is, what they're going to do to grow your performance. And so there were question marks surrounding how these pitchers would react to Bailey and if they were going to be receptive to him. Tanner Houck going six strong innings and feeling like he pitched as well as he could have pitched has to be a great confidence booster for him. And that's something moving forward that he can take with him because the more that he is able to utilize that internal confidence, the more it's going to translate over to his starts. And so then he can start to really lock in and have a fantastic season. I mean, if we get this version of Hauk all year long and he's our five starter, that's going to be a problem for opposing hitters. Like I've said on the show over the last few days, small sample size still because we really are at the very, very beginning of the season still. We won't know the true identity of these starters for a couple months. Likely around June-ish is when we'll start to really get a feel for what these starters actually are. Once they're in that grind heart of the season, they've played a lot of games, they've traveled a lot, they still have half the season left. So mentally, they might be starting to get a little bit checked out or frustrated In those moments when it gets tough is when we're really going to know what these pitchers are. And also, I would like to see them stack up against other teams, primarily ones in their division, because their division is very tough. So I think once they start playing other AL East teams, that's when it's going to be a real test for them of, okay, this is where we're at relative to other teams. So I'm interested in actually seeing that. How do they stack up? Because if they can continue to pitch effectively against their division and other teams in the American League, then they definitely have a shot to compete. So what I'm looking for moving forward is, can they all continue to pitch with that level of confidence and command that they displayed in their first start? And Tanner Houck, in particular, he's improving his pitch arsenal. Can he keep that up? That's something we're going to be looking out for moving forward. And coming up, I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail about why Tanner Houck's start was as strong as it was and what's the mentality there and approach with these pitchers. 
If you're ever looking for last minute tickets for any event, Game Time is the place for you. I actually used Game Time recently because I bought tickets to the Dan and Shay concert at TD Garden on April 13th, which, by the way, is going to be a fantastic show. Dan and Shay, one of my favorite all time country artists. I'm so excited to see them perform. They have great music. And my friends and I wanted to go to the concert and Ticket prices were really high when we were looking, and I suggested game time. I went and looked. Of course, the prices were a lot cheaper than other ticket vendors, so I was able to go on, snag tickets, and see my view from the seat so I would know what I was getting myself into and what I was paying for. So that's something great that game time does that no other ticket vendor does is They'll really ensure that you get the lowest prices and also that you're getting a view that you're comfortable with. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with code first pitch. Terms apply. That's code F I R S T. P-I-T-C-H for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. You can really save so much money with Game Time, so I highly recommend you checking it out today. I also recommend you checking out Locked On Sports today as we have launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on youtube and now it's also available on amazon fire tv in the free fire tv channels app locked on sports today is here for you 24 7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of locked on plus our national shows covering every league find locked on sports today now available on the free fire tv channels app locked on sports today is a great way for you to stay caught up in all things going on in sports. And we as a network are the only ones that have a sports 24-7 streaming channel. So if you are looking for a way to stay up to date with everything, check out Lockdown Sports today or check out Lockdown Sports today on Amazon Fire TV or YouTube. You won't be disappointed. Tanner Houck had a great start on Monday night, going six strong innings, only giving up three hits and no runs and striking out 10 batters. And what's changed with him? What made him be that confident for the whole start and be able to pitch deeper effectively into games than we're used to seeing from him? It all is about Andrew Bailey's approach, and I've talked about him a lot on the show and why he could be a good fit in Boston, but we're starting to see part of that reason why now he is altering the pitch usage of these guys and making sure they're throwing pitches that they're confident with, but also ones that are not as easy for opposing hitters to attack. Andrew Bailey did explain the strategy and basically explain why he's getting Red Sox pitchers to use their fastballs differently this year because that's the biggest thing here is the fastball usage of Tanner Houck and other pitchers. And Bailey said, we speak a lot about the fastball in general being a jab and equating that to boxing. If you're going 12 rounds or 8 rounds, you're not going to win by throwing jabs the whole time. The damage is done by throwing your haymakers in your best sequences. Jabs need to be located supremely to do any damage. So when you look at that through a baseball lens, it's knowing where and when to use your fastballs and leveraging your best off-speed weapons to do the most damage against the hitter. That's a really powerful quote because it's basically explaining that there's a time and place for the fastball and a lot of pitchers overuse it and that's why they aren't as effective so what andrew bailey's been really honing in on is having the red sox pitchers throw more off-speed pitches so that they're throwing off the hitter and then if it's a good time to use a fastball then they go and challenge that hitter and attack the zone Now, for perspective, Tanner Houck threw 83 pitches in his start on Monday night. Zero of those were four-seam fastballs. 
Overall, 53 of his 83 pitches, which is 63.9%, were off-speed pitches. All of his fastballs were two-seamers. So no four-seam fastballs at all, and the majority of his pitches were off-speed ones. Now, the difference between all these pitches is that a two-seam fastball is designed to be thrown with a lower arm slot and less spin when compared to a four-seam. It's going to feature more horizontal movement than vertical movement, so it really forces a hitter to have to see more of the base path and it really forces the hitter to have to be more aware of the zone and knowing when they should swing on it and when they shouldn't. So it keeps hitters on their toes a little bit more than the four-seamer will. The two-seam fastball is generally one of the pitcher's fastest pitches, but it doesn't have quite the same velocity as a four-seamer. It's one of the most frequently thrown pitches in baseball, but the primary difference is just that location of where the pitch is going. So he used a lot of two-seam fastballs in his Monday night start, but no four-seam fastballs. So that's something that Andrew Bailey is definitely trying to utilize more of is not using that four-seam fastball unless it's an opportune time. Tanner Houck, I mean, relying on the slider, sinker, split finger, and cutter for a good amount of the time is something that's going to prove to be successful for him. That split finger pitch, he definitely utilized in the game as well. The splitter is generally thrown slower than a fastball. The average four-seam fastball from a right-handed pitcher in 2010 was 92 miles an hour, while the average splitter was 85 miles an hour and the average changeup 83 miles an hour. Those numbers have increased a lot since then in general because pitchers can throw... 95 a lot more now for their fastball but that splitter keeps opposing hitters on their toes and it helps pitchers to feel like they have more up their sleeve and it's really about the grip of the baseball and how they're adjusting their fingers to make the pitch go where they want it to. The pitch is basically thrown with a normal fastball arm motion, but because the ball's loosely gripped between the fingers, as opposed to a good grip with the fingertips like the fastball, the split finger has a lower velocity because of that, but it fools hitters because they aren't expecting it as much. So it's interesting that this is Andrew Bailey's approach because he is encouraging the guys to only use their fastball in opportune spots, and it was rarely used by Tanner Houck, and it hasn't been used nearly as much by any of the other starters so far this season either. So I'm intrigued to see how that strategy works out for them moving forward because the one concern with that is it's a lot more work on the pitcher's arms to be throwing off-speed pitches a lot more. The arm and its natural motion is more acclimated and used to that forcing fastball. So this strategy of implementing more of the off-speed pitches is something I definitely like because I think it's going to serve these pitchers well moving forward in terms of opposing hitters' struggles and inability to predict what's coming. So I like that about it. However, it might just be hard for them to maintain their arm health all season long like they would be doing if they weren't utilizing the off-speed pitches as much. That's just something that he's going to have to watch out for, Andrew Bailey, is making sure that it's not too taxing on the starter's arms and that they're not getting completely worn out by May or June. So he might, at some point during the season, start to adapt a little bit and add more fastballs back into these starter's regimes and having them utilize it more for the sake of their arm strength so that they can last the entirety of the season. But we'll see how it goes for now. It's definitely allowing them to win games and allow the offense to do its thing. And it's making the starting pitchers look completely dominant. Andrew Bailey might have been the answer for this Boston Red Sox team. A lot of it is about bringing in the right person to work with the pitchers because everybody's development process is different and everybody's form of communication is different and things that they can learn and things that they can't learn and the way they learn are different. And Andrew Bailey seems to have a way to connect to every pitcher's learning style. And that's huge for this team. And just his personalized approach 
of having that strategy of implementing less fastballs with every starter, but also honing in on each individual starter strengths and allowing them to pitch to those strengths. It's going to be key moving forward for this team. And I really hope that the Red Sox starting pitching as a whole continues to dominate in the way that it has. I understand that it's way too soon to say that it will happen or that it won't happen. We definitely still need to see more. But the idea is definitely there and the strategy is definitely there. So if it can be continued to be utilized, then I think this rotation is going to be a problem for opposing hitters. And we could see a Red Sox team that is a lot better than people think if that's going to be the case. So I'm just hoping that they can keep this up because I really like what I've seen so far from the starting rotation as a whole. And I'm such a big fan of Andrew Bailey. I think from both a personal standpoint and a baseball standpoint, he's great to have around this team because off the field, his personality can really connect with the guys. And on the field, he obviously has the pitching knowledge and he has a vision for what can work and what can't work with these guys. So hopefully we continue to get length from the starters, confidence from the starters, and that they're just continuing to motor through and not giving up a lot of runs because it's been definitely fun to watch these starters so far. So enjoy the rest of the West Coast trip, by the way. Not that much more time, just closing up the series here today with Oakland and then heading to the Angels and then done with the West Coast trip. So something to look forward to is not playing at 10 o'clock at night starting next week. So as always, keep the faith, go Red Sox, and I will catch you on the flip side.